Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm gonna go through this presentation pretty quickly, but I'll be around, so I'd be happy to talk. It's really nice to see some old friends and uh, a bunch of new ones here as well, so thank you so much for, for just having me. Um, but I wanna start this presentation a little bit um, by talking a little bit about what I did when I was, um, when I did the Wanderlust in New York City thing. I asked people to think about what to just meditate on how it would be if everyone in, on this planet really truly felt as though they had everything to contribute, that, they're, that they were missing nothing in where they lived, in how they felt, in the jobs they had, in the, in the spiritual, economic, and environmental world that we lived in. Just like meditate on that and think about how that is for people going forward. And, um, you know, and I hope that when you, as you watch this presentation, you think about that and just think in awe and express great gratitude in your own lives about where you are, but also think about that there, it isn't always like that for a lot of other people. And so with that, I actually have a little confession to make. Um, I uh, have something in common with the Tea Party. <laughs> yeah, I actually believe that Unlike the Tea Party, well, the Tea Party believes that we, that we need to see our president's uh, birth certificate in order to believe that he was actually a native born citizen. I don't believe that. But what I do believe is that we can and should have a smaller government. And I believe we can do that by creating jobs for some of our most expensive citizens. And so who are our most expensive citizens? Um, they are often the folks who use an enormous amount of social service dollars, but don't necessarily feel much better at, at, even after that expenditure. So people who are coming back from our wars, our veterans, people who are in generational poverty, uh, people who are cycling in and out of our criminal justice system. And also, the, the same people who are not necessarily feeling as though they contribute much to society, even though they try in many of their own ways. Um, so my talk today is really about um, how we can create opportunities for people that also, pr for the, the, our most expensive citizens, but also provide opportunities for the entirety of the planet as well. And so actually I'm gonna start with a little bit about just giving you an example of who I am. First of all, I grew up um, in the South Bronx. My parents moved there back in the 19, late 1940s when I, um, long before I was born, not that long before I was born actually, but. Um, they moved up there from down south, and it was part of their great Ameri that great American migration of blacks moving up from down south in search for their great American dream. At the time, the, the neighborhood itself was a mostly white working class community. People literally walked to work, you know, from the residential section into the resident into the into the uh, manufacturing core, um, and then lots of other folks from down south, and then later on, the um, uh, the Caribbean started coming as well. White flight happened. Highway construction, you know, people our age often think that, you know, highways were always there. They weren't. They're actually a fairly new occurrence that happened only the past 70 years um, in our communities in the South Bronx. They were literally created to make it so that, you know, you could connect wealthier communities on either side of it. And we lost about 600,000 people because of the highway construction. Um, and whole neighborhoods were often just destroyed because highways were literally built where thriving communities once were. This isn't the first financial crisis that we've been through. Um, one that I literally grew up in was when um, banks started drawing red lines around areas where they, called, that's the term redlining, where they weren't gonna make any kind of, of public investment. And what happens you know, to your community when your, or we are property, or your body for that matter, if you don't put um, work into it, if you don't put resources into it to keep it up, it's gonna fall into disrepair. Oh, and this is around the time I came in. I like to think of this as an early networking opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm on the phone with Santa Claus. Um, you know, I'm here with the Easter Bunny. He said I've been a very, very good girl. Um, but this is what I grew up with. You know, all that financial disinvestment, the highway construction, it devalued our community so much that landlords started torching their own buildings, committing arson in order to collect insurance money because that was the only profitable thing for them to do. But this is what I saw, you know, from the very, from the time I was about six up until the time I was about 14 years old, this was my neighborhood, literally. And um, in many cases, these were our playgrounds, although I heard that in our community, um, we, and literally, so around the time when uh, uh, um, school budgets were being slashed, and so they were literally taking out um, playgrounds and music classes and things like that. So this is where we played. 
And, uh, but I remember nightly news reports talking about our community as if it was a war zone. And I knew in my mind that it wasn't because I had this big brother, Lenny, who did serve in a war. He served two different terms in Vietnam. And, but the problem was he came home, he lived through that, but he was killed when I, when I was about to turn eight years old in, the, in a drug war in the neighborhood right next door to ours. But all of that type of financial disinvestment really did pave the way for all of the environmental disin problems that came later. Um, remember, we were this manufacturing community. People walked to work to get to these, these, these working class jobs. And instead, they all moved. They were outsourced. And then we ended up getting a huge amount of the waste that came into those places, from waste to sewage treatment to power um, generation. And then later on, um, even we, we saw 60,000 diesel truck trips as well. But, and so it's not just as the, the environmental problems are not pleasant to be around um, because for whatever reason, they're also very hard on our public health. For example, um, we found out just a few years ago with conclusive evidence that proximity to fossil fuel emissions can cause learning disabilities in young children. And where do you find those fossil fuel emitting sources? Chances are they're gonna be in poor communities where they're also poor schools. And we know that poor kids who do poorly in school have a better chance in this country statistically of going straight to jail rather than onto higher education. So it's like we've created this pathway directly um, into prison. There's also the issue just with breathing in fossil fuel emissions um, and the pollution because of it exacerbates uh, things like uh, asthma and other respiratory problems. We've got one of the country's highest asthma rates. Diabetes and obesity are also absolutely directly related to um, environmental conditions and communities, you know, from the fact that there are food deserts to the fact that parents are often not willing to let their kids go outside and play in an area where the air is repellent or they think that their kid's going to get hit by a bus. And so I got started um, in this work. You know, I did not want to come back to my community. I mean, it, we were on the nightly news all the time. I did, you know, when w the, the, the legend of the South Bronx would precede me before I walked into the room. People thought that if you were from there, you were a pimp, a pusher, or a prostitute. Not something I wanted to be associated with and did my darndest to make sure that I completely cut myself off from that. I was a smart kid, went away to school, had no intention of moving back to my community until I got into graduate school and was absolutely broke and had to move back in with mommy and daddy. Um, and so I did and <laughs> found out that, and fortunately for me, found out that I had a, the, the capacity to see things differently, even if they were right in front of me, um, that the, the community that I thought I knew, I didn't know at all. My, we found out that the city was planning on building this huge waste facility right on our waterfront. And instead, um, and, but I discovered that we already handled an enormous amount of our city's commercial waste. And this facility would have brought another enormous amount right to our waterfront. And I thought, oh my gosh, this community isn't just disgusting and dirty because the people in it are that. It's there are policies that were put in place that actually encourage the kind of development that happened here, both environmental and economic. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is not something I can be party to. So I could either leave or I can do something about it. And I chose to stay and work to help create a much more sustainable solid waste management plan that I think all of New York City and all of New York State actually benefits from right now. So I'm excited about that. But the reason that I stayed was because of, actually, this dog right there. That's Zena. Um, I got Zena around the same time we were fighting against the waste facility, and I, was, uh, I kept getting these notices about doing Bronx River restoration projects. And I was like, well, that's sweet. I mean, I knew that there was a Bronx River because I saw it on our, a subway map, but I didn't know, I had no clue that it was literally six blocks from my house. Enter Zena, who at the time was no more than about eight months old and totally wild and crazy. She's 13 and had a stroke recently, so she's a little slowed down. But um, she literally took me jogging into what I thought was this nasty illegal garbage dump. And it was, you know, when this was an, a relatively newer picture, but there were literally piles of weeds and garbage over my head. And, um, with, and if I didn't have an 80 pound kind of slightly scary looking dog, there's no way I would have been in this dump by myself. But when I got to the end, there was this amazing river that was sitting right in front of me. And, and I'd never seen it before in all of my life, all the 30 some years that I'd lived there at the time. And I flipped out and realized that this was the beginning of my neighborhood's waterfront transformation. 
and was able to think about you know getting community members and and local businesses and the city involved to literally say like this is how we can start doing this work and I wasn't afraid to talk to anybody and fortunately was able to help raise three million dollars to turn that that dump into this park Thank you. And it's become this absolute jewel in the local community that really has just created all sorts of beautiful things there. And I loved it so much that I got married there, that with, with Zena as my flower girl, and that's my husband over there too. Um, I like him too. Um, but <laughs> it wasn't just a beautiful place to get married, which it was, but what it really said to people in our community was that we mattered and this was an outward expression of that. No one expected something this beautiful to be in a place like the South Bronx. I can assure you of that. But we showed that we were there. And it emboldened us to think about what else we could do. Like how else could we show our beauty? And um, someone told me about this really cool uh, federal transportation grant. I know federal transportation is not that exciting to most people. But when it came with the idea that you can use it to really reimagine your community, it suddenly became really gorgeous. And um, so I wrote a proposal for $1.25 million to plan a greenway, which is simply a dedicated bike and pedestrian path that goes around the waterfront and on street as well. And uh, we were able to raise nearly 15, 50, as in 5 0 million dollars, including about 25 in stimulus money because it was a shovel ready project to start building you know, much of this stuff. And these things, it's not just you know, a great, beautiful park, which is, it is because it helps get people more physically active, but it's a stormwater management system you know, that does it naturally. Um, you can create economic developments that are you know, consistent with this type of development. We were really excited about this. And so this is the street that leads down to the park. And this is what it's going to look like as we start building on it, which we did last summer. So I'm really psyched about that. Um, but the thing that is most encouraging to me is the fact that we've had, um, that we were able to help people see that they had both a personal and a financial stake in the environment and improving it. So we started one of the country's very first green collar job training and placement systems um, called BEST. And we were able to train people starting in wetland restoration because we started on the waterfront. And then later on, urban forestry management, green roofing, um, learning how to clean up contaminated land, you know, anything that could actually create a better, more holistic approach to developing the environment. And we worked with folks specifically who were generationally impoverished and also those who had been, you know, in and out of jail, you know, for most of their lives or that's what they saw. And we were able to not just give people the hard skills but also the soft skills of how do you be, you know, a great employee and possibly a great business owner as you grow. Um, so we we, were, we would do things like you know, help people be a team players, help people be leaders you know, in their own personal development, how to look busy when their boss was around. I mean, little stuff that I'm sure y'all all know, but if you've never seen someone with a job or had a legitimate one yourself, although some of these guys were actually quite incredible businessmen, just not in the legitimate economy. Um, <laughs> so you know, they actually have something to teach us. But, uh, it, but, you, but think about that and how they suddenly, they were ta taught in so many ways that they would never amount to anything. And Suddenly, they were able to show that they produced and were contributing in such a tremendous way. Um, we also had to show that green wasn't just a sort of like earthy, crunchy kind of tree hugging thing, which is, you know, cool because I've hugged a few trees in my, my own life myself. But we also had to show that it was this, it was money as well. And so we started um, our own green roof installation business. And green roofing is this sustainable building technique that's been used in Western Europe for more than 60 years at this point. And you literally plant a roof for the stormwater management benefits, it attracts between 75 to 90% of the water that falls on it so that it doesn't have to be processed by a really nasty sewage treatment system. Um, you know, it, it's a green layer, so it naturally cleans the air. Um, it also makes your roof last like five, ten times longer. I mean, some of the oldest ones are almost 80 years old at this point. Um, and so this is what it looked like when we first planted it a few years ago. And it's just little seedlings and plugs. And I'm sorry, you can't see this, but it really is quite beautiful. It's like this lush carpet of like green and pretty pink and, and yellow flowers. It's fabulous. And this is on top of my roof. And we wanted to show also that you can do different types of things on rooftops as well. Um, so this is the one we did on, on my old organization's headquarters. Um, this is a little medicinal herb garden and a little um, urban agriculture uh, template and the best strawberries I've ever eaten in my life. Um, 
and we got visitors from like wildlife. This is a hawk. We named him Henry, and uh, I called him Hank. So, uh, but this is, uh, you know, we're not saying that when you do this type of, this stuff is green infrastructure, the, 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 the wetland restoration, the, um, you know, the, the park development, um, uh, urban forestry, all those things, the green infrastructure, because they naturally do the type of infrastructure things that things like sewage treatment plants, you know, like air pollution control plants do. All, it does those things, except it does it naturally the way nature intended. So we're not saying that we would ever completely get rid of these type of municipal things like these huge sewage treatment plants, but these things we know are sort of single use, they're ugly, nobody wants to live around them, they're almost always in poor communities, um, so no one really wants to have it. This is an actual Google map of my community and my roof, that little green spot, that's me. Um, but just imagine if we created the opportunity to build much more of this green infrastructure, imagine the stormwater management savings, imagine the air pollution control, um, imagine just all of those things that, you know, that we count on, you know, and when we live in cities or even rural areas, but imagine the fact that we could create a smaller government by having people who would otherwise um, be considered tax burdens suddenly become taxpayers because they're also providing a service as well and, and having the dignity that that provides. Um, those most expensive citizens act also, the, the, the value, the therapeutic value of working with horticulture is something that cannot ever be discounted. And there are reams and reams of information and studies about that kind of stuff. So you want to see this type of things happening. So again, think about turning tax burdens into taxpayers, making our most expensive citizens some of our most productive ones because for themselves and for society. And so just to give you uh, some quick examples of some, of, oh, well, this is me. So anyway, this is who I am. I started this, this company um, called the Majora Carter Group, and we work to really create um, opportunities to, uh, to, to bridge the idea that the green economy is something that is for real. And uh, so we work to develop local economic development strategies. And so the way that I like to do it is thinking about hometown security as opposed to homeland security. Because there are, when, we, when local people, nobody really honestly is waiting to solve, to, to, um, for big government or for big business to come and save them. There are local people working right where they are to solve the big problems of their day. And I want to give you a couple quick examples of some of those people right now. In Los Angeles, Andy Lipkis started an organization called Tree People, yes, links trees and people, to, um, to really create opportunities for both. And so they found out, you know, many years ago, just how much water, you know, and, and money, resources that Los Angeles, the, you know, the state of California spends in terms of pumping water into and out of the, of the state. They found out that uh, the Los Angeles School District was about to spend nearly two billion dollars to fix the school systems and 10% of that budget was specifically to go to asphalt and air conditioning. Andy and his team convinced his folks, uh, convinced the school district in the city that if they actually got rid of some of the asphalt that was already there, did some very strategic and aggressive greening, that they actually could save the city money in air conditioning costs, thus they didn't wouldn't have to add you know, their huge air conditioners. Um, and they also saved money because the work that people were doing here actually was cheaper than the air conditioning costs. And also, when kids get a chance to see this kind of greenery, there's studies that show they do better in school. So it was a win-win for everybody. Um, so next we have, where are we going next? Oh, we're going to Chicago. Um, Brenda Palms Barber had a really interesting um, little predicament on her hands. Um, she, was she was tasked with coming up with a plan to keep ex-offenders out of jail. So she came up with a very, very obvious uh, uh, project, which was to train them to become beekeepers and turn that, the, the honey that they harvested into skincare products. Very obvious. And um, <laughs> so they, <t> <laughs> they did. So these guys and gals learned to harvest the honey, um, you know, uh, train, take care of the bees. Uh, they turned the, the, the honey into this value-added skincare product, and then they merchandised it, marketed it themselves, did all of that work, and found clients in, in major hotel chains in Chicago and also in Whole Foods. And her recidivism rate is actually less than 4%, unlike the 65% national average. So to talk about a sweet beginning, it is. Um, another one is we're going to go to West Virginia. Um, Judy Bonds is a coal miner's daughter, coal miner's granddaughter. If anybody felt that coal should stay king, it would be somebody like her. However, Judy also saw the 
unbelievable economic costs and social and environmental costs of what that was like in her community. So Judy actually lived, used to live in a place that was very much like this in the mountains in West Virginia, um, except the mountain that, that actually nestled uh, Eight generations of her family fell victim to mountaintop removal coal mining, where they literally chop off the top of a mountain in order to make this happen. And uh, they, and so at some really nasty economic costs. And also, this is you can't see it, but that that jar is holding black tap water that comes near from from one of those mines. Judy discovered, however, that there's wind power in them, their hills, and that if by chance you created those opportunities, then you could have people working for a really long time. You don't have to chop down mountains. It's a really beautiful thing. Judy and I met several years ago and we swapped t-shirts, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> and the back of mine says, um, save the endangered hillbilly. So imagine if a home if a home girl and a hillbilly could recognize that there is some value in greening, you know, things that way, then I think anybody else can. The problem was Judy was a victim of her own environment. She died uh, this January. She got lung cancer, you know, from where she lived. And uh, it was pretty horrible. But you know what? Homegirl left a business plan, and we're going to help make sure that her legacy lives on. And Winona, up in Minnesota, um, you, people, lots of people know her from being a um, vice presidential candidate, uh, but she's also really interested in working on food and energy sovereignty you know, on the reservations and off of them. Um, so they actually started their own windsmithing uh, uh, company where they have, are training you know, the Native Americans on, on their reservation to do this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, we notice some of her activist activities have gotten her into a little hot water. And so the local utility is keeping that windmill, which was actually a 30-year-old wind windmill recycled with parts from a Renault car, um, turned it and they won't let her connect it. So, but she's going to do some more work around that really soon, I'm sure. And I, I learned how to, to, um, to, to skin a fish, got taught by Winona LaDuke and her boyfriend, can you believe that? But anyway, she's also, and when you think about the obesity and diabetes rates in, in, on the native reservations, which actually has the highest in the country over any ethnic group. You know, and these are people who know the land better than most of us, frankly. Um, so they actually work to create um, a farm to school program that supports the local farmers and the school children as well. And all of these people, by the way, um, you can find them. If you listen to the promiseland.org, you can just go get on the website as well. And but this, the things that I'm really concerned about, going straight from Winona into some, one thing that we're doing right now is, you know, we know about the food system, American food system, how it doesn't actually support pretty much anybody or anything. You know, toss a lot in, in um, energy costs, water. Um, we know that it's making people fatter and less healthy. Um, what we're trying to work on right now is developing our own national brand of urban grown produce as a way to create jobs and also healthy food that can be sold directly into institutions in any particular local area. And because uh, if you grow hydroponically, you can actually grow up to 10 times more on this, in the same area um, than you can traditional grow in farming. And you also use a lot less water. There's literally no waste coming out of these, these things. And they provide jobs in areas where you desperately, desperately need them as well. Um, we're tech, right now, we're working on some couple trademark issues, but the name of, the, of the, um, the, the brand is called Root, as in Root for your hometown, New York or Detroit or whatever it is. And um, the, the whole idea is that when people really are very interested in supporting their own hometowns, even if they have problematic relationships with it, like I did and still do to some extent, but when folks are, most people are given an opportunity to support local developments, they will do so as well. And so I'm really excited about this and hopefully you'll be hearing about it and hopefully we'll be launching in Chicago really soon. But I wanna leave you with this. The quote that I, that I wanna show you says, it says, I hope sirs you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was down in um, Memphis, Tennessee. He wrote that as a direct response to a letter that he received from, the, from a group of, of white Birmingham pastors who were really, I think, concerned about his well-being, but also um, just, they just wanted him to slow down on the integration stuff. And, and the, the letter from a Birmingham jail, if you've not read it, it is possibly one of the most beautiful, amazing, powerful things you're ever going to read. But this is my absolute favorite quote. And because, you know, we can't, we can't afford to just wait for things to come. We have to be impatient about wanting 
environmental equality, economic equality, um, social equality, and we cannot stop until that happens. And if you think about his life in particular, the fact where was he you know, on the last day of his life when he was down in Memphis, Tennessee, and what was he doing? He was there fighting on behalf of black sanitation workers who were given the worst jobs, the most dangerous jobs, and for the least amount of money. So he was there fighting for their, their racial equality, but also their environmental as well as their economic equality. We have to be impatient about the kind of world that is there for us to live in because we can build that. Thank you for your time.